I believe that the threat to our democracy is so grave that we must find a way to pass these voting rights bills. Debate them. Vote. Let the majority prevail. For months, Republicans have used the filibuster to block debate on both bills as GOP senators have remained united in their opposition to federal election laws. The smallest majority we've ever seen in our politics is trying to change the rules for how people get elected in every single state. Meanwhile, Republicans aren't the only lawmakers holding up action on expanding access to the ballot box. Despite the impassioned speech from the president, not all Democratic senators are on board with getting rid of the Senate rule. The most notable, Senator Manchin, a supporter of the Freedom to Vote Act. Agreed to support Senator Joe Manchin's bill. So that's what this bill is. Mm -hmm. And we're finding some real issues trying to figure out why is it that when we decided to support his bill, he seems to be supporting a filibuster of his own bill. In Washington, I'm Mariana Menise for Making the Case. As we just heard, 18 states have passed new laws since the 2020 election that make voting more difficult for communities of color. But the attack on voting rights is both widespread and multifaceted. Gerrymandering is another tool that lawmakers use to limit the power of the vote, and it's just as dangerous. In Florida, lawmakers are using the headcount at prisons across the state to shift power. And joining me now to discuss is Desmond Mead, a, a founder and executive director for the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Desmond, as always, lovely to see you. It's always great to see you too, Yodi. Thank you so much for having me, Yodi. Listen, right now, Senate Democrats are frantically trying to find a way to pass voting rights legislation in an effort to counteract new state laws aimed at suppressing voters. Um, it would also help to put an end to a form of voter suppression called gerrymandering, um, again, a practice where one political group tries to change a voting district to, uh, to help them and hurt the opposing group. But there hasn't been enough effort Desmond to crack down on the practice of prison-based gender mandar or gerrymandering, that is. For viewers who may not understand what that is, can you expound and tell us about your organization's latest study and findings, please? Yes. You know, when you when you talk about prison gerrymandering or even even redistricting, we have to go back to the census, right? And understanding that people who are in Washington or the number of representatives that are in Washington is a determined uh, by the uh, population of a state and, and how it, the lines are certain uh, are, are drawn. And so when you talk about, you know, we have the census where people who are incarcerated in uh, certain facilities throughout the state are counted as residents of that county. What it in fact does, it gives uh, uh, that county more representation or actually uh, I would say uh, uh, an illusory representation of that county, which results in that county or that district getting more representation there and the county in which or the district in which that person was actually living before they were uh, incarcerated uh, would not get the representation that they're supposed to have. You know, and it touches on other things as well as far as resources uh, that would go into that district or into that county, uh, resources that can be used to help support reentry services for those individuals. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this conversation, when we're talking about prison gerrymandering, it's basically using uh, the prison population to bolster uh, political power. How is, um, you talked about the Census Bureau, how do they define uh, residency? And so that, 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 that has been very problematic. And I think that's one of the the uh, uh, challenges that we have, and the, the rules are, are loose enough to allow counties to count people who are incarcerated in the prisons located in those counties, even though by all intents and purposes, that person does not reside there, they're just incarcerated there. And so when we would get, uh, I, I think, revised policies or better policies that would mandate that a person should be counted 
uh, their last known address, especially if they're incarcerated, right? That would actually solve a lot of the problem as it relates to prison gerrymandering. But right now the rules are loose enough to allow uh, counties to go ahead and count prisoners as if they were residents there, you know? And and, and the irony to that is, is that you're counting uh, 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 people who are incarcerated as residents to gain political power, but yet these very same people are not even allowed to vote while they're incarcerated, right? And so not only uh, do we have taxation without representation, we have je prison gerrymandering without uh, proper representation. So essentially they'd be phantom constituents, right? So if an incarcerated person were to write to a lawmaker about an issue they care about, they may not get correspondence back because they don't have any voting power, correct? Have none whatsoever. And, and their voices are, are, are silenced. Their bodies are being used, uh, but their voices are totally uh, discarded. And, you know, the thing that, 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 that one of the main things that irked me, because our organization, we, we champion causes that would uh, benefit people with previous felony convictions and and we're fighting for safer communities and fighting to reduce recidivism and we we understand that one of the key things when you're talking about even the, the prison population or mass incarceration is the key component is how are we reducing recidivism how are we reducing the flow of people going back into prisons right uh whether they're violating probation uh, uh which is a, a, a serious driver of incarceration nowadays. And one of the key elements to that is what kind of services are we providing these individuals as they're released back into their community? And so while they may be counted in Baker County, they're being released back into Dade County without any resources in Dade County to help them successfully reintegrate back into uh, uh, mm. their own community. That is very problematic because, you know, the, the whole country, I mean, in any community, whether it's conservative, progressive community, at a, you know, at a core, you know, everyone is, is concerned to some degree about public safety. You know, uh, folks want to live in crime-free neighborhoods the whole nine yards, but if we're not doing things to help reduce crimes, then we, we can't really uh, complain about, you know, the, the levels of crime, right, because we are engaging in practices that help perpetuate you know, uh, recidivism. Well, Desmond, uh, there's so much more that we need to talk about, but I'm running up on a break. Uh, I've got more with Desmond Mead coming up, so stay tuned for more Making the Case. We're talking about the issue of prison-based gerrymandering and its impact on communities of color. Still with me is Desmond Mead, founder and executive director for the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Um, tell me, Desmond, just how widespread of a problem is prison-based gerrymandering? I mean, it isn't just happening in Florida. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we see happening basically throughout the, throughout the entire uh, United States. You know, uh, some states are, 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 are apparently better than others. Uh, even here in, in Florida, you know, we do have some counties that will not count uh, 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 prisoners. But, you know, at the same point, we have counties in Florida where the prison population accounts for about a quarter of that county's population, right? And, and, and so this practice will go on not only in Florida, but throughout the country because it's beneficial uh, to whoever is in, in power uh, at the, this particular mm -hmm. time. They, I mean, it's going to be hard to get rid of that, you know, because no one wants to relinquish uh, the upper hand. And, and, and we, we have this back and forth between parties, uh, one side trying to one up the other. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what's, who's suffering are American people. We're caught in the middle of this tug of war. So, okay, so what if, what if there was a county that wanted to um, give up the counting of incarcerated people um, and is it too late to do anything? Because I know the, uh, the Census Bureau collected their data last year and so whatever decisions a state or city made, um, are they locked in for 10 years until the Census Bureau comes around again to conduct uh, a new data? They're basically will be locked in. You know, this year, uh, you know, lines are being drawn and, 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 and they're going to be drawn based on the census data. And so the next time that there's an opportunity 
to uh, uh, rectify those, to redraw those lines are going to be after, no, within another, what, 20 years? And then maybe we'll see some kind of course correction. But that is totally dependent on whether or not either uh, the Census Bureau is changing its policies or its rules uh, to ensure that people are, are being counted uh, where they truly reside or whether you, you know we have county officials that is going to uh, believe in doing the right thing, right? And not counting mm -hmm. uh, people who are incarcerated in their counties. Desmond, I know that your organization um, conducted a study and looked into uh, the addresses of some incarcerated people. Um, is that how it's determined? Instead of determining that their residency is where they sleep uh, at night, which would be in prison, um, you go back and look at where they lived prior to their det uh, the detention. Um, what if they don't have an address? Uh, what if uh, an, a person came from out of state? How, how, how is that dealt with? Well, as far as out of state individuals, you know, uh, we know that they, that they account for less than 5% of uh, Florida's prison mm -hmm. population. And so the majority of folks do have a county in which they were convicted. They have a last known out, uh, address. Let me uh, let me back up for a second, Yodit, because I think it's important. Because when we talk about what is the uh, uh, one of the uh, intended purposes of the census, and when we talk about redistricting, is really the the country getting a body count of where people are, right? And 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 being able to determine where people are would help folks in 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 Washington in our capital determine how much representation that area would need, right? And, and also determining how much representation that person would need. They're also determining how much resources need to be allocated to those areas. And so for instance, if you have area A that may have a thousand people and area B with, that may have uh, 20,000 people, we know that we need more representation in area B with 20 more thousand people. And we also mm -hmm. need more resources for those individuals. What happens is that area A is given the illusion as if they have 10,000 people instead of the 1,000 people right. and resources and a, a, a representation is allocated to those, uh, to that particular county. And that is taking away the representation from people in uh, County B, uh, which means that we have people who are living in counties who are going back home to counties, right? And that are not, are not accurately represented in Congress, right? And, and we're seeing what's going on in Congress now. And part of that is because there isn't an accurate representation of the people, right? And one of the frustrations that we have is why Congress, why is it so hard for Congress to just bend towards the will, will of the people well, part of it is there are people there that's not really representing as many folks as they claim they're representing. And so they care little about that, you know. And it doesn't just hurt the uh, a returning citizen. It hurts the community in which they are released to. Absolutely. You know? That means that everybody in that community have less representation than they're supposed to, as well as less resources. Right. I mean, it can mean the difference of getting resources to, to a school, to fixing that pothole in the road. Um, definitely counter to the purpose of one person, one vote. Desmond, how might the political well, so landscape... Me... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, but well, let me just say this piece, because you mentioned something very important. It goes beyond congressional districts, because when you talk about redistricting, they're also uh, uh, drawing districts for schools, right? And so the, the, the type of education, uh, uh, the resources that's pumped into the school districts are also... Uh, impacted during this process. And so it's not, it, it goes beyond uh, a congressional lines. Uh, when you look on the county level, there are also lines that's, that's being drawn as well. Well, Desmond, while I have you here, um, I definitely want to get your take on uh, President Biden's uh, address in Atlanta on Tuesday. Your thoughts on that? You know, you you know, I'm always hesitant when when we talk when we start talking about politicians, right? Because listen, you know that old adage says it's not, it ain't fun when the rabbit got the gun, right? 
And, and, and the one thing that, that I've learned over the years is that even when you talk about felon disenfranchisement, you talk about gerrymandering, right? These are tools that were used by both sides, right? Uh, and I, I think that when I look at those tools, I think of these are tools that is used to suppress the vote, right? Or to pick and choose who get the vote for someone and who don't get the vote for someone which now I look at it as these are mechanisms uh, uh, that are used to really deteriorate the democracy that we aspire to have, right? And so even listening uh, 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 to the president uh, yesterday, yes, there were great points that the president made, right? But I, I still, in the back of my head, is remembering that, you know what, that's still a politician uh, that's representing a particular mm -hmm. party uh, in, in a lot of cases. And at the end of the day, you know, I am more concerned about how are we engaging in conversations with everyone? How are we engaging in conversations where we don't necessarily have to say, we're right, you're wrong, right? And the other side is saying, no, we're right, you're wrong. And while all that is going on, right, there are people that are suffering. You know, I mean, we, we, we've seen this throughout the COVID pandemic and, and, and many other cases that when politicians are going at it, that we suffer. And sometimes we need politicians to either step back and let the people uh, 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 express their full uh, intentions and let them lead, or have these politicians be more aligned with being a public servant, right, rather than a politician. Well said, so my friend. More. Desmond Mee, founder and, ex and executive director for the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Again, thank you so much for your advocacy and work, my friend. I appreciate you.